Hi, this is Tech again, and today I'm going to do a bit of a continuation of the cache mod on the Pentium 3. Now, I want to try to run the cache of AMD Athlon on Intel chips. Now, there's a reason behind that, and that's basically that these came with higher rated cache on the high end. Uh, there is chips here with 350 megahertz rated cache, whereas the highest end on the Pentium 3 is 300. Now, unfortunately, I, I didn't really found much documentation like pinouts and stuff. However, I found some documentation from NEC on uh, numbering schemes of DRAM, which is not really correct in this case. Well, it's it's DRAM-ish. Uh, anyways. It, it looks like they have the same bit organization and both have four ranks. They're also both uh, 256 Mac chips. Uh, 256 KB, I mean, not Macs, of course. Uh, so, I, I think there is a slight chance that this actually works. Now, for these I have, both of these are 4 nanosecond Samsung's, hope you can see that. Uh, part number is slightly different. Um, again, pinout, uh, I have no clue. I couldn't find any documentation whatsoever. But the form factor, so the package is the same, which gives me enough hope to give this a try. Now, again, I'm going to test this chip here and see if the cache works fully. Then remove one of these chips and throw on one of these. So I will show you a working chip hopefully in a second and then we continue from there. Now I'm not quite sure how I'm going to try to remove these. I think I will probably heat up the PCB from the back and well probably destroy the PCB in the process but that shouldn't matter. Anyways I'm going to quickly Put a cut here to a hopefully running Pentium 3. Okay, here we are. As you can see, our cache is detected. Now with these chips, usually if something is wrong with your cache, it's going to say zero kilobytes there. So, looks like we have a working cache on this Pentium 2. Uh, Pentium 3, I mean. Now let's get back to the bench and start removing some, crack, some cache from our AMD chip. Okay, here we are now. Don't feel too bad for these little AMD chips. This one is obviously dead and so are all my donors because, well, a lot of my chips I get from uh, recycled, like uh, electronic recyclers. And a lot of them crack open the cartridge in really, really, really bad ways and destroy the chips. So fortunately, like, I would say 50% of the slot CPUs, maybe even more, I get are dead and irreparable because they have uh, basically flexed the PCB and it popped off the core or put like small dents uh, or cracks in the uh, silicon itself. So it's not just like a ripped off resistor or something like that because I would definitely fix that and, and keep the Athlon XP well. Maybe, uh, Athlon, I mean, not XP, that was later. Uh, maybe not in this case because it's 500 megahertz CPU, which is not really that special at all. Anyways, let's get cracking and remove the case. Uh, case, cache. Case is already long gone. Again, preheating PCB a bit. No, I'm, I'm still not sure if we're going to heat it up from the back and then like hope that they fall off or something or I'm heating it up from the front and sort of force the chips off there because with removing them it's actually not really important if you destroy some traces or anything because it's not like we're going to use this chip nice and hot put a bunch of flux on here I think I will hit it from the back and see what happens Actually, maybe for addi additional safety, hold the cache chip on. 
a piece of copper. Because I want to keep it as cool as possible for as long as possible. So it basically reduce the risk of us killing the chip here. The PCB is already getting really really hot. So I'm going to turn it around and hope for the best I guess. Trying to heat it up around the chip. Yeah. When you remove these, try to uh, not point the hot air at the chip directly and especially while the chip is, uh, like, when the chip gets desoldered, uh, do not point the hot air at the chip of the PCB because then you don't have the PCB as a heatsink, sort of. Uh, and it's going to definitely die. You, know? you can 100% tell when they are dead, you can't tell 100% when they are alive. Uh, when they are dead, basically you're going to see that the, the plastic or epoxy casing rather has, maybe it focuses now, okay, has m sort of melted and isn't straight anymore. Anyways, uh, let's clean this one up a bit and see how the shape is now. Uh, Okay, I think that's the last bridge gone. Let's get the ink chip. Zoom out a bit. Now I'm going to obviously remove one of those. the dummy. Oh. I guess flux is also some sort of thermal conductor. Anyways, uh, let's move the bottom one I guess. Uh, be right back. Get some tape. Captain tape here is uh, really useful for protecting the, the slot part of the CPU from any solder. Because once you have solder on there, you're not going to get it off. And while the CPU will probably still work, I like the slot part to be nice and golden. Anyways, throw a bunch of flux on here. Going to preheat the board a bit. Already burning my fingers, nice. I think it's going to be directly in view, yes. Fortunately I can't do much about that because I want to blow away from the core and where did my copper thing go? Away from the core and away from the second cache chip. And push it over to the right as I did with the last ones. There we go. Cache chip is gone. Now, 
I'm going to clean up those pads here and I'll be right back once we have a chip on here. See you. Okay, so here we are. As you can hopefully see, those are two different part numbers. If it would focus at least, then you could see it, I guess. Come on. Here we are. Now the top one is the original Intel cache, the bottom one is the one from the AMD chip. Now, kinda curious thing I just noticed while soldering is that the AMD chips don't have a tag chip anywhere. So that thing here. I guess they integrated it into the CPU. Hopefully that's the case at least. Maybe they integrated it into the cache and I don't know, that wouldn't make any sense though. So I guess next step is to just throw this in a system and see if it boasts. Be right back. Okay, here we are. Now before I do anything, I want to say that I think the chances of success here are, well, maybe 10%, because I don't think they just put different part numbers on there for no reason at all. And I don't think those things are compatible, but let's see. Now, keep in mind, these, these things do post with broken cache as well. So, simply seeing this doesn't really mean a whole lot. Let's go into BIOS and set, check if we have our cache enabled and also set the CPU to 450 MHz or 500. I think it's 500 chip. Uh, user define. Set this to 100. I think that was a 500 megahertz chip, not that it really matters. Uh, let's leave it on default. Check if we have, no, that's not the right one. This one is the right one. L2 cache is enabled. So let's reset and boot into OS and see what happens. That's a uh, 500 megahertz chip. Now, our first indicator will basically be if, if Windows takes ages to load, then we don't have cache basically. Or if it doesn't load at all, which might also happen. Yes, date and time is invalid, I know. Okay, we are in OS. Now the magic moment. Open CPU Z and see what happens. Straight to 5%. I think this is amazing sign. Nope, it's not. What the hell? It opens straight away, usually if it does that we have cache. Now it looks bad. I don't think this cache is the same, which I would have guessed, but never hurts to try. Now, if I feel like it, I might try another cache chip, but I don't think that is the issue here. I think it's genuinely just not compatible. Also, wait a second, I, I might try one more thing. Uh, restart. Now this still doesn't mean I'm going to throw away all my, my broken high-end uh, Athlon chips. You can obviously still use the cache chips from those to put them on lower-end AMD stuff. And basically do the same as I did with the Pentium 3 before with the 600 mega, uh, 300 megahertz cache on a 450 chip or a 500 chip, can't remember, but a lower rated chip. Uh, chips as features, I don't want that. What did I want to do? Ah, yeah, right. Set this to 66 megahertz and see if it works at lower clocks, but 
I don't think that would make any sense whatsoever. I think it's genuinely not the same pin out. And I'm just sort of pulling low some, some data or address lines or something and it's going to be mad at me because of that basically. Again, unfortunately I, I, I don't have any pinouts because if I had, I wouldn't have just thrown the cache chip on there, I would have actually looked at the pinouts and checked if they, at least the pinouts are the same externally, from from which point you could uh, have more confidence in this stuff working. But documentation on, on this old stuff is basically non-existent. It just takes ages to boot already, I don't think it's going to work. Nope, doesn't feel like it. Now I think I'm, uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, put a Intel cache chip on here and see if I've write the, the tech chip or the this uh, well anything else on the on the PCB of the CPU basically. Nah, still no cache. Well, I will just look for a random Intel chip now, I guess, and and throw that one on there and see if we can revive it or if putting the wrong cache on the CPU uh, damages the CPU. Okay, so here we are. I put back the original cache chip. So maybe, let me show you. So why does this camera not focus half of the time? Those are now two of the same and hopefully we didn't kill it when removing it. Anyways, I'm going to throw this back and, and see what happens. Okay, so I'm back. I already turned on the system and as you can see We have our cache again. Now, I guess we learned two things from this. One is that AMD cache definitely doesn't work on Intel chips and two is that the cache seems to be not nearly as temperature sensitive as I would have thought because as you have seen in the video before we basically well, heated up the chip directly when we removed it and that hot air was set to 440 degrees, so I'm honestly surprised it works. Uh, I, I was expecting it to not work and, and wanted to basically try again after that with a chip I removed uh, more carefully and well, it looks like you can heat up those things quite a bit and they're still alive, so maybe that's a good sign for uh, cache modding other Intel chips in the sense that it's not going to be as unlikely that it works, so basically better chance of success there. Anyways, I hope you sort of enjoyed this uh, really really random video and continuation to the Pentium 2 series, or Pentium 3 rather. I will also do some Pentium 2 stuff. Uh, Especially because uh, the original Pentium 2s have uh, four cache chips and I want to do some some trickery there and uh, test some stuff there. Uh, also replacing the tech chip maybe because uh, of the, the only 512 megabyte cacheable stuff and stuff like that. Try to run uh, like one gig on, on uh, Pentium 2 or something. I will will come up with something because I definitely enjoy messing with this old platform and well the possibilities you don't have on modern stuff like swapping cache, swapping the controller of the cache and, and just messing around with hardware mods in general. Anyways, that's about it and well the Pentium 2 system will be back soon I think. <laughs>